It's hotter than the feud after a heel turn in this bitch. Oopsie, the worst rapper alive. Oops. Yeah, yeah. Big Max back on the mic like oops. Back on the horse, still jumping through hoops. The missing link in pink, I don't lip sync. Just to be clear, choking isn't my kink, but I do it anyway sometimes, I guess. Gotta laugh now, die later in my times of stress. I'm blessed, feeling good, charged up like a Hadouken. Mota de Tabanakis, see, welcome into the Worst Wrestling Podcast. I am your host with the least, Jack Lusne. I am off this weekend. I will be in Ontario uh, visiting uh, family, so I will not be live. But this episode is dropping in my place. Uh, and I will try my best to drop a bonus review for SummerSlam, uh, either su uh, Sunday or Monday. We'll see if I make it. But for today's episode, I'm kind of predicting, I guess he's already a heel, but a further entrenchment of the heel turn for Dominic Mysterio. I'm expecting the turn uh, on Rhea Ripley to happen at SummerSlam. And so in honor of that, I thought it would be fun to do my top 10 favorite heel turns. Uh, these are mostly, mostly 90% in WWE. There is one that was so big. I had to include it on the list. I'm sure you guys probably already know what I'm talking about, but we will get to that later. Uh, before we kick this off, as always, guys, this is an organic fan-driven show, so I would super appreciate it if you could super kick that subscribe and like and drop some comments, but especially if you could send me questions and ideas for stuff you want to see on the show, questions uh, like uh, fan questions, ask me anything, would you rather, whatever, whatever. Hit me up at Jack Lusne on all my socials, or you can always send emails to worst sports channel at gmail.com. So, definitely some recency bias on this list. I also want you guys to know this is not, uh, as always with my list, these tend to be my top 10 favorite heel turns as opposed to what I view as like if I was doing a unbiased, like, uh, top 10 list of just the greatest of all time. Like to me, these are my top 10 greatest, right? It's like a, a top 10 movie list. Everybody's movie list is going to be different because you can allow your own bias to play in. That's what I like to do for these lists. I let my bias play in. Like I don't expect this to be anybody else's top 10. This is my top 10 greatest heel turns of all time. And we'll start with one that just happened. AJ Styles uh, turning on Cody Rhodes with the fake retirement. So this was an homage to Mark Henry, who you can already see in the graphic, and we'll talk about a little bit later. But uh, the fake retirement from AJ Styles, I think could have been even higher on the list, except I think every – fan in the know like every smart mark uh who knows a little bit about their wrestling history knew what was coming here like we i think there was everybody was calling the fake retirement especially as soon as he came out in the pastel blue suit uh wanting to talk to cody um this it was telegraphed and yet it still worked um i think on the heels of the match uh, at Backlash Leon, which I thought was an incredible match with an incredible atmosphere, uh, that crowd still to that might be the greatest crowd that we've ever seen uh, in terms of a WWE pay per view. But coming off such a legendary match, uh, a clash, if you will, and this fake retirement would then lead to the clash at the castle. I quit match, uh, both for the title. So I think, again, the the level of the story involvement for the WWE Championship with Cody Rhodes coming off of the big WrestleMania win against Roman Reigns in the bloodline, who we will also talk about later. Uh, I think even though this just happened, it already, to me, cracks my list 
for top 10 heel turns, at least in WWE. Uh, so that was number 10. And we can move on quickly to number nine. Sami Zayn gets power bombed at NXT Revolution by Kevin Owens. <laughs> this is this is like technically the first of many betrayals in WWE. It wasn't even the first time uh, that Kevin uh, Kevin Owens had betrayed Sami Zayn. On the indie circuit, Kevin Steen had already betrayed El Generico. So this was uh, reminiscent and homage to that almost. Uh, and this was actually Kevin Owens' debut. So I love that they didn't like drag this out. This was literally Kevin Owens debuted, won his debut match, uh, came out to congratulate Sami Zayn, and then powerbombed his ass on the apron. And this set up. A legendary run for Kevin Owens. I think still, you could argue, still the best run of his entire career, arguably. When he had that NXT championship and they had him come out and beat John Cena on the main roster clean. Ooh, that that meant something back then. And that this was like before, this was like when John Cena was still in his front. Like this meant something. They really established Kevin Owens in a huge way uh, when they had him go for Cena that first time with the NXT title. Uh, and Cena at the time was the U.S. champion. Like, uh, it was crazy. Um, so, like, I remember they were having the match, right? And I was like, oh, this is going to be a banger match, but I was expecting Kevin Owens to lose. And then Kevin Owens actually just won clean the first time. I was like, damn. And, yeah, Cena got it back the next time. But that that first one really solidified Kevin Owens because even though he was technically a heel, he was getting huge pops uh, when he first came up to main roster. Um, and I think that's kind of where they thought they could potentially go with kind of like a little bit of that stone cold attitude and angle with Kevin Owens. Um, and he never quite hit those heights. But I mean... Uh, I would take Kevin Owens' career in a heartbeat, obviously. Uh, you know, a uh, former world champion many times over uh, has had mid-card and tag titles. Uh, the longevity that he's had in WWE, the way that – I wish he could get off the bloodline angle because he's been involved in that with that for like four years now. But um, I think Kevin Owens just uh, – I always kind of almost forget just how good Kevin Owens is um, in the ring, on the mic, and in all facets of the game. But because it's like, oh, you know, my favorite's Gunther, my favorite's Daniel Bryan, my favorite's Elias. There's always, but Kevin Owens, man, Kevin Owens, I remember when he came on the scene, was right away like one of my guys. And still to this day, I'm like, oh, man, I just love Kevin Owens. Uh, we'll move on here. This would be much higher on most people's lists, but it's a little bit lower on mine only because it's a little bit before my time. But the breakup of the Rockers will come in for me at number eight. So, you know, this for me was kind of, uh, again, I would see highlights of this. This was, you know, I was told about this. Uh, this obviously happened in 1992. I was two years old. So this isn't something I saw live or experienced in the moment. This was definitely, you know, something that for me happened kind of after the fact of this was part of Shawn Michaels story, uh, part of, you know, the highlights and replays that I'd seen dozens of times. And I'd seen the segment uh, and heard about the rockers, but again, very much in the past tense for me. So that's the only reason that I have it a little bit lower on the list, I think for most people, but, I still recognize the historical significance of the breakup of the Rockers. Uh, one of the best young tag teams. They were super over. Uh, uh, shout out to Nick Opalewski. Had me uh, do a review of WWF Super Tape. Uh, and I actually had the pleasure of watching some uh, old Rockers matches. And yeah, they were over as fuck. So I can understand how this was like a hot heel turn at the time but we don't need to belabor the point since i wasn't there we can just move on to one where i was there 
and that's the original fake retirement with Mark Henry coming in at number seven. So the original fake retirement, and this was back all the way already back in 2013. So it's kind of funny that, uh, you know, a decade later, uh, you know, 11 years later, they did it again, part de with AJ Styles. But the original, the OG, the the big heavy, Mark Henry, back in the day, 2013, would come out and uh, announce to John Cena and the world that he was retiring from the WWE. And then he would go, psych! And he would slam John Cena's soul out of his body, uh, which would lead to a match at Money in the Bank for the title, which I didn't pretty uh, John Cena at that time, Super Cena was just like you couldn't couldn't get over Super Cena. It was just lol Cena wins. But it was a, a great uh moment in time and it ended up being one of the highlights of Mark Henry's uh career and one of his better feuds. With John Cena, even though it wasn't like a super long one, it was very memorable. So, a star that burned bright uh, and burnt fast, but Mark Henry fake retirement, the OG, definitely makes this list at number seven. At number six, again, maybe this is just recency bias. And I thought about the original uh, time that he turned heel because I was there for that too. But Man, it made wrestling cool again. The final boss, The Rock, coming back to turn heel for WrestleMania 40 and the lead up uh, to Cody Rhodes versus Roman Reigns and Bloodline Rules for the World WWE World Heavyweight Championship. Uh, the title that uh, Dusty had never won, the title that Roman had held for four years. And, you know, uh, having, I don't think it was originally intended necessarily. I'm not really sure what the original intention is because I can tell you I did watch the documentary about the, the lead up to WrestleMania and how they... They sell it in kayfabe on that documentary as if they actually did plan to go with The Rock versus Roman Reigns in spite of Cody Rhodes having won the Royal Rumble and being able to pick Roman Reigns, the which was like the clear and obvious story. And um, I wonder, I think the ar the real argument And they didn't admit to it in the documentary. I think the real pivot happened in the moment at the Royal Rumble when CM Punk ultimately got hurt. And they had to make that call in the moment in the ring. And you had Cody win the Royal Rumble back-to-back -to, -back to essentially set up Roman Reigns versus Cody Rhodes. I think as soon as that happened... You had to tease the idea of Cody not getting his WrestleMania match. That's a thing that that's like part of the WWE playbook almost. And I think it's underrated. You know, Triple H is an, a fantastic booker, but he really idolizes Vince McMahon in a lot of ways. And there are a lot of similarities in how they do business. And you look back at storylines that Triple H himself was involved in, um, whether that was during his career or during his time when he was, you know, reigning supreme in NXT. Uh, and I think there is a lot of that that kind of plays over to how he books in this modern era. And so I think creating doubt and creating a convoluted story and path for Cody Rhodes to have that WrestleMania match was always part of the plan. 
That's what's best for business. But how you create that authority angle is extremely important because if it's not believable, uh, you get like the, the fucking talking laptop. You get John Laurinaitis. You get, um, you know, Brad Maddox once upon a time, who I completely forgot was even like a GM. Uh, but hysterically enough was the GM when Triple H was involved in the Daniel Bryan angle when he pulled that swerve which I think people kind of almost forget about too, of how he was, he was actually the face going into that match as the referee supposed to be impartial, calls it down the middle. Daniel Bryan ends up winning. And it's only after when Randy Orton comes to cash in the money in the bank that he then turns on Daniel Bryan, goes full heel and introduces the authority angle. And so, I wouldn't put it past them at all that once he saw the rock return, triple H saw this opportunity to say, Hey, I, I think I see a way Dwayne for you to, you know, turn heel. And, you know, the rock talked about in the documentary turning heel again, discussing that with his peers. And I don't doubt that those discussions also happened with other people. I'm just saying that I think ultimately they cooked it all up together, but I think that would have been part of Triple H's input is like, hey, you know, when I did the Daniel Bryan thing, I backed him and then I turned on him. And that made me the biggest heel ever going into that WrestleMania. And that's still talked about as one of the greatest WrestleManias of all time. And so if you kind of consider that and the way that the rock positioned himself again, initially almost by Cody's side and where Cody's having to step aside and give the rock like that wounded dog look until they get to the press conference. And then all of a sudden the rock really comes out and starts kind of shitting on Cody Rhodes, his family. I think people really kind of missed that part of, and the way, cause the way he did it was subtle of, you know, the rock, came out during that press conference and basically, you know, he showed the the bloodline tree and everything. And he says, there really is only one Royal family in wrestling and it's mine. It's the bloodline. Um, so again, just kind of like placing himself above the Rose name. And that's supposed to be the slight that sets Cody off. And, uh, that's why he talks about how, you know, the rocks uh, grandfather would be disappointed. And then the rock slaps him and that, and then, you know, all hell breaks loose. And all of a sudden we're back to Cody Rhodes versus Roman Reigns. And you get all of everybody involved with the bloodline angle uh, with the tag match going into night one and then Seth Rollins involvement in night two and everything that happened on night two. Like, again, some of it, I definitely think occurred in uh, as a manner of timing in terms of like, yeah, the rock returning obviously changed things and how they booked it. Do I ever think there was a, an idea or a thought in their mind that they weren't doing Roman versus Cody too at Russell? No, uh, there's no, there is no, I am just, I was born at night. I wasn't born last night. So there's just no version of the story that they're going to tell me where I'm actually going to really truly believe, you know, and maybe that's to my detriment. Maybe I'm just that pessimistic that I, even if it was true, even if it was legitimately true, I don't think I could believe it that they actually just plan to have the rock come in and step in and say, Hey, sorry, kid. Sorry about your Royal rumble, but I'm taking this match. Like a year, fucking two year build and start. I just don't see any scenario where that was legitimate. Like for, I think people like, I I think you would be almost like misunderstanding Dwayne Johnson as a person and how he does. But I just don't see a scenario where he like thought that would be okay. Like again, I struggle to believe that part of the documentary. There's there are certain. And they're good at really building on certain truths because the best lies are built on truths. But um, yeah, the the work that 
The Rock did once he then turned heel. Fucking just reminded everyone, A, why The Rock is one of the greatest of all time, especially on the mic. And it really carried, you know, and electrified, hey, pun intended, uh, that storyline heading into WrestleMania. That, that, that was one of the biggest WrestleManias of all time. And I think a lot, it was in large due to The Rock as the final boss and that heel character and that turn. So I think even more so than when he became the corporate champion, the the Rock as the final boss was my favorite heel turn of his entire career. And so it makes it into number six on this list. And we will move on to number five. You know, we just started at the end. And now we will go back to where it began. When Roman Reigns finally turned heel for realsies and joined Paul Heyman all the way back at Payback uh, 2020. Uh, So this was shortly after having returned at SummerSlam. Roman Reigns would win the title at Payback and align himself officially with Paul Heyman, and that would kick off the beginning of the Tribal Chief era, which would last all the way until WrestleMania uh, 40, which we just discussed in the last segment. So four years he carried that title. And that is the longest title reign of the modern era. And the bloodline story, you could argue, is the greatest story that's ever been told in professional wrestling. And I don't even know how much I could really fight you on that because when I think about the way that it started on such an emotional, cathartic level with the Usos and the way that he had to really beat the Usos into line, especially Jey Uso, main event Jey Uso. Um, So, you know, the way that that storyline unfolded until they finally were a united front. And then, uh, you know, all the way through to WrestleMania, the first time, 39 against Cody Rhodes, and you had the introduction uh, of Solo Sokoa. Uh, I don't think that was the first time Solo had showed up. But, no, yeah, no, Solo showed up to beat Drew McIntyre at Clash. Was that the first time Solo showed up? I don't know. Solo's always fucking showing up in a stupid hoodie and popping people with the, with the thumb of death. Uh, so Roman, can, that became a theme for a while where it was actually kind of boring, to be honest. Um, but, you know, during that four-year reign, again, the, the stuff with Sami Zayn was incredible. I, I the When the Usos turned the second time, it was incredible. Um, and when Jey Uso teased uh, actually being able to beat Roman that time. Uh, th- there was so, m- there's so much that's happened with the, bl- and then like, again, all the stuff with Cody is just like in the bloodline story and angle, the way that they've managed to keep it going for this long. And now even to this day you have, and now when Roman Reigns comes back, Roman Reigns coming back as a face. So the, the Roman Reigns heel era officially ended at WrestleMania. Absence makes the heart grow fonder. You've got this uh, wish level uh, bloodline running around led by Solo Sokoa. People are out here in the audience chanting already, we want Roman. So you know the, the heel era is over. Roman's, Roman's already a face. He hasn't even come back yet. He's already a face. So I think uh, – I'm excited, and I'm excited. Trust me, I'm excited. I'm hoping it happens at SummerSlam. I know a lot of people are pausing it. I don't know necessarily that it happens at this SummerSlam, uh, but I think that would be incredible. But we will see. Um, but yeah, uh, just to wrap it up, Roman Reigns uh, officially turning heel all the way back at Payback and winning that title and carrying it on the the longest title reign of the modern era. That was number. See it. or wait, no, that was number five. Sorry, number five and number four. 
420. Yeah, that's why I mixed up the numbers on the last one. Uh, number four, we have the fame, the infamous Champa, Tommaso Champa, aka Triple H, turning on Shawn Michaels, aka Johnny Gargano. No, I'm kidding. That's just some R Truth bullshit. Um, so yeah, Champa, Tommaso Champa turning on Johnny Gargano. Uh, this was at NXT Takeover Chicago in 2017 after their tag team ladder match against AOP, where they could not uh, get those tag titles back. Uh, they lost the titles to uh, AOP. And, you know, they're on the ramp, and they're celebrating, and you get the logo. This was the infamous logo betrayal, where we all thought it was the end of the show. And then and then Tommaso Ciampa attacks uh, Johnny Gargano and takes him out which would lead to arguably the greatest feud in NXT history. Uh, Tommaso Ciampa versus Johnny Gargano. They would have three spectacular matches, uh, including like a street fight and like an all out, like I quit match. It was, it, it, the matches were fantastic. All the whole three set of them. If you have never seen those highly, highly recommend to me, this was, the highlight of the NXT era was like through basically through like Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn, like the Kevin Owens, Sami Zayn betrayal all the way through to like Adam Cole, the end of the Adam Cole era. That was like the absolute tits of the NXT era, and especially the black and gold era, obviously. And there have been incredible matches since I really love the current iteration of NXT and the roster that they have going on right now and a lot of the stuff they have going on right now. This is not a slight uh, to the the current iteration of the product or even the rainbow version of the product when they had Braun Breaker uh, kind of leading the way. They, I, I, I maybe wasn't as in on it as I was on this invested emotionally in this black and gold area. It's hard for me, I think, like, when I get like that huge emotional cathartic release to kind of continue with things. And just as another example, really offhandedly, like ever since uh, Avengers Endgame, like I will watch like Marvel movies, but I'm not, I'm not like trying to make my way out to the theater. Like, Oh, I gotta see like even no way home. I love no way home. I bought a copy of it though on DVD. Like I waited until it came out or uh, like DVD, Blu-ray, whatever. And it's like, like even Deadpool Wolverine right now. I've gotten spoilers. Don't care. I'll still I'll just buy it on Blu-ray DVD when it comes out, and I'll watch it then, or I'll watch it on streaming when it comes out. Like I'm, I feel like I popped that bubble for Marvel, and I felt that same way a little bit for NXT. And it's not to say that I don't super enjoy uh, NXT matches. Like I'll tell you, a guy I really like there right now is Oba Femi. That guy is a beast. Uh, so, again, I, I do watch some NXT. I'll watch uh, their pay-per-views that they have. But in general, I'm not as invested as the Black and Gold there. And especially DIY in that tag team run they had in this betrayal, the Chomp, the Chomp turning on Gargano, this was so huge at the time. And it still stands to me as the greatest rival in NXT history. And that's why it's so high on my list. And speaking of high on my list, we'll get into the top three. We talked about the final boss earlier, but there was another huge component of that WrestleMania feud and run up and match, and especially the ending of the match at WrestleMania 40 and how Cody ended up winning that title. And it was the betrayal of Seth Rollins when Seth Rollins turned on the shield on raw june 2nd 2014 the shield were at their peak having beaten evolution again this it was almost like incredible that like evolution couldn't even get a win in on these guys and then triple h uh the cerebral assassin in in kinetic unison with the the architect seth rollins 
you always got to have a plan B. And Seth would then turn on Roman Reigns and Dean Ambrose, a.k.a. John Moxley. And honestly, Seth uh, would have an incredible run after that. Um, you know, he would win the money in the bank. He would have one of the greatest money of, in the bank cash-ins of all time, turning the Roman Reigns Brock Lesnar match into a triple threat and sneaking away with uh, that title. Um, he would pin Roman Reigns in that match to get the title. Uh, and then uh, he would... He had to face Brock Lesnar, actually, uh, and uh, he was able – he carried that title for a while. He defended against Brock. I forget exactly how that ended, but he got away – he got out of it with the title, but he took a beating or something like that. Um, but ultimately, uh, that would set up Seth Rollins for, like, the rest of his career, and I always loved Seth Rollins as a heel even more so than a baby face. Uh, the the feud also, I think, underrated coming out of that betrayal. It wasn't even Seth Rollins and Roman Reigns. It was Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose. Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose literally had like the hottest feud. Um, what It reignited my interest level uh, to a certain degree in professional wrestling at that point in time because uh, they did the thing where Seth uh, did the stomp on um, – moxley through the cinder blocks uh, which set up their hell in a cell match and i was hot, all hot and bothered for that and then it ended in kind of a shitty way you know as much as i love bray wyatt him showing up in that match uh to just uh take out moxley uh and then just it cold ended the feud between mox and seth rollins where because mox obviously had to go in a feud with bray bray wyatt at that point and it's like, oh, but like, you literally could have just had like a full on blood brawl in this Hell in a Cell. And honestly, you should have had Mox win it, which would have set up the rematch with Seth um, and then have Seth win that and then have the rubber match at WrestleMania. Like, I I feel like they really let go of what could have been one of the greatest feuds of all time uh, in like a, an actual like, you know, three match feud kind of set up similarly the way. You had Ciampa and Gargano, which we just talked about. I I feel like they had that in the palm of their hand with Seth and Dean, and they wasted it with, and as much as I love Bray Wyatt, again, this is one of the few times um, where I really disagreed with the booking of Bray Wyatt was throwing him into this Hell in a Cell to just take out John Moxley, uh, leave him for Seth to win, and then Seth moves on kind of scot-free which really doesn't tell the end of that story, right? You don't get the ending, cathartic ending of Mox versus Seth. And then Mox just kind of fucks off onto a feud with Mox versus Bray, which was largely forgettable. So, you know, I think um, this could have been even higher on the list. I think for a lot of people, it's arguably the greatest heel turn of all time because of the history of Seth and Roman Reigns. But, you know, to me, I remember it a little bit differently. And the next two on the list, I don't think anyone will argue with me. To me, they're the two biggest heel turns in professional wrestling history. They're also the most important in terms of our history. And when I say that, I mean, if you're a millennial or younger, like this is our, you know, or, you know, especially or if you were in that uh, Gen X era, because you were kind of like a young adult at that time. Like, this was two of the biggest heel turns that I can remember, like, as a child, like, being actively, like, oh, my God, I can't believe it. And the first one, which was, comes in at number two on the list, Hulk Hogan is the third man. So, infamously, and this is the only one that's not in uh, WWE, obviously, but WWE having bought the company and owning all the rights. It technically is now part of WWE history, but it's, you know, what kicked off a lot of uh, the Monday night wars in terms of uh, the reason that WCW world championship wrestling won like 86 weeks in a row or whatever. It was because Hulk Hogan didn't just, it's not just that they signed Hulk Hogan because when he was a face, he, he really wasn't like doing that much is when they turned him heel and, it created the NWO 
and you had Hulk Hogan, Kevin Nash, and Razor Ramon, three former WWE superstars now in the WCW turned fully heel. You know, this was wrestling history. Bash at the Beach, 1996. I was six years old. Even I knew who Hulk Hogan was. And I was like, oh, damn, Hulk Hogan went to another company. Oh, damn, Hulk Hogan turned heel. Oh, damn. Oh, damn. So, you know, you could argue this was the biggest heel turn of all time. But I have one that comes in just a little bit higher. And that's because... As much as you can argue that the Hogan heel turn set up WCW for their 86 week run and what would ultimately, you know, be their shot to the bow across the stern of what was WWF at the time and what almost took them out, I really truly believe that what set WWF on a different path altogether from not just WCW, but every other company that had existed really up to that point. And, you know, what really cemented WWF and allowed them in a, a, to an extent to create the faces, the baby faces that became so white hot at the time. You To have such a, a great baby face, you really need a truly great heel. And I believe that the heel turn of Vincent Kennedy McMahon and the Montreal screw job is the greatest heel turn of all time. And I think this is for two reasons. One, it was fucking real. So real that it blew people's minds at the time. You know, the, Kayfabe was still a thing in 1997. So this was infamously, again, if you're not aware, the Montreal Screwjob happened in November 9th, 1997. Survivor Series, Montreal, Quebec, Bret Hart versus Shawn Michaels. And the backstage antics essentially was that Bret Hart was set to go to the WCW and was kind of refusing to relinquish the World uh, Wrestling Federation Championship at the time, the heavyweight championship. And there was already heat because uh, I think this was after Alundra Blaze had already kind of dumped the women's title on, on their WCW programming. I think Vince was afraid that Brett would show up with the main title on WCW if he allowed him to win this match. And, but ultimately as instead of telling Brett, like, no, there's just no way you're winning this match. Um, even if, and maybe taking the chance that Brett wasn't going to wrestle the match. He basically told Brett, yeah, you can win this match and then relinquish the title the next night on raw and uh, walk away from WWF. And that's not what happened at all. Basically, the, the fix was in. Um, and it looked weird as fuck, too, if you ever watch back the highlights. Basically, uh, Shawn Michaels has Bret Hart in a sharpshooter in his own move. And he's you can see Bret's clearly going to counter it. And then all of a sudden, kind of the ref starts waving his hand and the bell starts ringing. And nobody really knows what's going on right away. And there's some moments of confusion and then ultimately they announce Shawn Michaels as the winner. He looks pissed. Brett looks pissed. Everybody looks pissed. Vince is kind of trying to stand there, look like a confused schmuck. Um, but then Bret Hart spits in his face like legit. Uh, and then obviously coming out of it, we got the Brett screwed Brett interview. Uh, and this would set up Vince McMahon as like the legitimate evil boss the the legit like you know the overlord of wwe and when you think about stone cold and his rise to fame it really came on truly the heels of the vince mcmahon heel turn because all of a sudden you had like you had in steve austin the blue collar representation of working america and you add in Vince McMahon, the slick rep, you know, the representation of slick, evil corporate America. And you had those two opposing forces created arguably the greatest rivalry in wrestling history, Austin McMahon. Uh, and I think really of all the things that 
helped WWF thrive, survive, and ultimately beat out WCW. Yeah, it was creating all the new stars that they did. But a lot of that, again, was on the back of evil Vincent Kennedy McMahon. Think about, it, like, again, you know, he he was part of The Rock becoming the corporate champion and then ultimately turning face by turning on Vince McMahon. Uh, and, like, uh, the McMahons essentially, you know, had a mainstay as, like, an evil faction all the way through. Even to the point of the Daniel Bryan authority angle, you know, Triple H and Stephanie McMahon, again, the authority at that point, representative of a reiteration of the the angle of Austin McMahon, arguably the most successful rivalry of all time. And that's why I think so many people remember the Daniel Bryan WrestleMania run as one of the greatest of all time is because you created again, that same, when you create in wrestling, especially that, that cathartic feeling of a true authoritarian boss that represents kind of like corporate America. And then you have like, like the blue collar working representation of middle America, the wrestler for the crowd to get behind. Like that's, that's where you really get like some of your your greatest um, face runs of all time because I I think the white meat baby face of like the Hulk Hogan era of the eighties it was dead at that point in the nineties already um, and you know you could argue that the Attitude Era helped kill it uh, or you could even argue that the Attitude Era was responsible for that uh, for that kind of you know beloved pessimism you know looking at the bad guy as the good guy you know the way that we now boo the the white meat baby face and cheer for the heel um i think again a lot of that is prevalent and comes from that era of wrestling and so again i think when you look at what started all of that it was the montreal screw job for better or for worse so that is it for me, um, again, I super appreciate you guys making it through the episode. I hopefully will try to come up with a SummerSlam review uh, that I can post as a, a bonus pre-recorded episode. Uh, but yeah, if you guys could smash that subscribe button and uh, drop some comments and likes, that always helps the algorithm stuff. But until the next time, I'll catch all of you guys on the flip side. My positive contact results in affirmative impact Never pull the rats on raps I'm never primitive, but cannibalistic, vicious Characteristics, I read the terrible potency Yep, I said it gains, yo Ever the eight MCs at extraordinary speed Some of the beers like Some of the razor blades and grease in your bare feet I see your fucking colleagues misprize you Very much to your dismay So today, I can say you won't be running away Hold your tail between your legs I'm gonna advocate when you fail with low stakes I'll take a hacksaw to you cockeyed Mumble rap slack jaws Leave you shredded on a side like some coleslaw the double time with that clothesline from hell like Bradshaw I'm toxic like septic shot a dying breed like